You're listening to LeaderCast, episode 198. Welcome to LeaderCast, Transforming Missions podcast with Tim Bias and Sarah Thomas, providing you with insights and resources you need to lead a movement of Jesus followers. Usually you hear Sarah's voice doing this. I'm just going to tell you that this month we're focusing on history and context in leadership. And as Sarah always reminds you, you can find show notes at transformingmission.org forward slash podcast or go directly to transformingmission.org forward slash 198. Again, we're focusing on the history and context of leadership, and we're going to start with a story of a German Methodist church, and in fact, it may even be the first German Methodist church in, ever to exist. And Sarah, weren't you the pastor of that church at one time? I was, and it was part of my dissertation, so I know a little bit more about the history of it because I had to research it than I would normally know the history of a church. So we've probably already given it away a little bit, but Tim, if I were to ask you, where was the first German-speaking Methodist church in the world? What would you say? Well, if I didn't know already, I'd say it would be in Germany. Right. That that would be the, the logical choice. But in actuality, the first German Methodist church started in Cincinnati. Um, the first German-speaking Methodist church in the entire world is located in Over the Rhine. And when it was founded, it was called First German Methodist Episcopal Church. So stick with me for just a little bit of a history lesson. This historic congregation was the starting point of the first German Methodist mission in the world. Now hear me focus there on Methodist mission. German-speaking Methodist missionaries in the Ohio Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church were sent to Cincinnati to reach the German immigrants who were moving into the city. German-speaking missionaries were also sent from Cincinnati to Germany to establish Methodism in Germany. It was from this congregation, a German immigrant by the name of Ludwig Jacobi, returned to Germany to establish German Methodism. So remember his name, because we're going to come back to it. The historic significance of First German Methodist Episcopal Church is rooted in the German heritage. The desire to minister to the community was present from its inception. In the 1800s, the German immigrant population increased, making these new residents a logical focus for the church's ministry. So, notice what they were doing. (laughs) They recognized the people that were in their community and who they were trying to reach. In 1833, a man by the name of Adam Miller responded to an advertisement by the Bishop of the Ohio Conference of the Methodist Church for a German-speaking preacher to reach the German population moving into Cincinnati. Now, I'm kind of chuckling even reading that because, Tim, can you imagine? (laughs) Hey, we're just going to advertise and see who, who we might get. Miller, speaking Pennsylvania German, was interested in reaching German immigrants of Cincinnati. Shortly after, Miller sought out a man by the name of William Nast. After traveling to Zanesville, Gallipolis, and into the country, Miller finally found Nast recovering from an illness. He had hoped to be able to give him spiritual comfort and to receive from him the lessons in the German language. Convincing Nast to be a part of the ministry was a challenge, however. Miller urged Nast to translate the Articles of Religion and General Rules of the Methodist Societies into German. While the specific reasons for his request are unknown, Wesleyan history notes the importance of these documents in establishing Methodist societies. Miller was initially unsuccessful in persuading Nast to assist him in ministry. They parted ways, Nast returned to Kenyon College to teach, and Miller returned to his preaching circuit. In January of 1835, William Nass secured his victory in the long struggle with doubt and unbelief. That is a direct quote. 
during a revival in Danville, Ohio. He now desired to preach Jesus Christ to the new German immigrants. At the end of the school year, he resigned his teaching position, entered the Ohio Conference, and received his appointment as a missionary to Germans in and around Cincinnati, Ohio. He arrived in Cincinnati on September 15, 1835. Nass' missionary spirit took him into marketplaces, beer gardens, saloons, private homes, and tenement houses. He was mocked, persecuted, and treated poorly. The first place he found common ground was at Wesley Chapel. In his first year, only three converts would be reported. He was reappointed to Columbus in 1836, but returned to Cincinnati in 1837 to a changing climate. The First Methodist Society was organized in 1838, and a chapel was rented for $200 per year on the west side of Vine Street and 4th Streets. The chapel was named after the property owner and became known as Burke's Chapel. At this location, Nast had an encounter with a young, educated Jewish man named Ludwig Ludwig S. Jacoby. During his gathering at Burke's Chapel, Jacoby sat in the front row with the intent to disturb the preacher. His sneering glares caused Nass to change the text to Romans 1.16, and the preacher continued, There is a young man here. <laughs> there is a... Preachers, don't do this. <laughs> there is a young man here whom God will turn from Saul to Paul and make him a great power among his people if he will but listen to his voice and yield his heart to him, him being God. True to Nast insight, a decade later, Jacoby was sent to Germany to establish Methodism and became known as the founder of German Methodism. That's quite a story. <laughs> That's one church. One church, the stories that exist in the places that our churches exist, that we have either forgotten or haven't uncovered, those were not stories that anyone who was a part of the congregation knew. Those were stories that digging through historic records, I was able to uncover about this church. And in doing so, part of what I realized was there were threads that wove from the very beginning of this congregation and the formation of this congregation until the present day. And one of those threads was that missionary spirit. One of the threads that no longer exist, you can probably guess it, was the German language. There was nobody there that was still speaking German. But while I was there, what was popping up all around the church? But breweries. (laughs) The context, well, it was almost 200 years later, well, a lot had changed in that community. There were some things that were in that community that were returning right back to what the historic roots were including the difficulty that existed in that neighborhood around race relationships, around poverty and issues of wealth and how that all played out. And all of that was really in the fabric and the bones of that congregation. Let me ask this. Wonderful. I, I love history and I love context. So that's a fascinating story for me. But how did that history inform your leadership? (laughs) Knowing in that congregation the missionary spirit that was present, the ministries that, that were happening there were very much focused on reaching the community that was currently around them and preparing for the community that was coming. Because... Well, no one liked it, and for a very good reason, gentrification was happening in that community. And to the point that I couldn't find, I was looking for a place to live, and there was nothing that I could afford in that community on a pastor's salary to be able to even live in that neighborhood around the around the church. Now, if I had looked five or seven years before that, it probably wouldn't have been safe for me to live there but I certainly could have found something. (laughs) Those were the changes that were happening. So understanding 
just that one small thread of the history of that church helped me to keep in mind how were we going to keep that missionary spirit going, whoever God is calling us to serve in this community around us. And it was changing. So you, it's obvious about this podcast being history and context for leadership that history makes a difference in terms of if, if we are to be the leaders needed for this time, we need to know something of the history and context of the congregations that we serve or wherever we're leading, the, whatever the agency, whatever the organization, we need to know something of the history and context to be the leader that's needed. Yeah, and and I think as we move through this month, the other thing that I think it's pointing to is the enduring legacy of the church. What does that history point to in terms of what will be, even if that church closes, what's the enduring legacy that is taking place there? It just seems to me that in the congregations we serve today, that history does serve a purpose, not that we want to go back to relive that history, but what were those things in the past that have helped make us who we are today that we need to continue to focus upon or or emphasize so that we can be, so we can live into our legacy. Somebody left a legacy for us. We're now preparing to leave a legacy for someone else. What are those things that we're hanging on to or passing on? Yeah, and is it in is it in that remembering, especially for the pastors, or if you're someone new in leadership in the life of the local church, that there is a history. And taking the time to listen. It doesn't mean that you're going to do things exactly the same way, but it may help you to understand how you got to the place that you're currently in, good, bad, or different. (laughs) And often I think what happens is people jump in and they start, and we act as if it's starting right from today. My first Sunday is the beginning of, no, it's just the beginning of your time as the pastor. There's a whole history behind you. Yeah, when I was the pastor in Peoria, part of the history of of that church, the pastor who was there in 1968, the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated, he marched arm in arm down Main Street with two other African American pastors to show their solidarity of the Christian community in regard to what had happened. And building upon that, while I was there, we were able to keep our presence in the community, in the, in the city. In fact, our, our motto was lifting up Christ in the heart of the city. And so what we did was work in the city because that had been part of our heritage, had been part of our history. So lots of times when somebody would say, this is what I would do, lots of times when somebody would say, why are we going to do that? And I said, it's who we are. When we, when we had a crisis, the pastor marched down Main Street. We're in a crisis now. There are people who are hungry. We're in a crisis now. There are people that need housing. What are we going to do? And so we were very clear about the part of the city that we were working in, but it was our history to do that. Yeah. So so that's that was part of how I led at that point. I've been in pastors of other churches that we did not do those things, because that was not our history. We started in a different way. Let me, let me do this. I've, several churches that I pastored were former Evangelical United Brethren churches, EUB churches, and they started with a focus, a very, a very clear focus upon faith sharing or evangelism and, and that warm outreach that they, they would have and started in homes and neighborhoods. That was the way one of them started. And realizing that history, when we began to reach out into the rest of the community, we talked about moving from neighborhood into the rest of the city because, oh, that's what they had done when they started. They started out in a home, and then they moved into the neighborhood, and then they moved to become a citywide church in another 
in another context. So sometimes, even when the church gets turned in upon itself, just remembering who we are and how we've gotten to where we are, we might be able to get out of that and move forward a little bit. That's that's part of what history and context brings to us in leadership, or at least in my thinking. So when is history not important? Well, I think I'd answer that question by saying I think all of history is important, but there may be some history that we need to um, to understand is not helpful. <laughs> I think we have to claim that history and not and not deny it. So there are parts of history, and I'll use it this way. One church that I pastored was the former Methodist Episcopal Church South, and it had a balcony. And its story was that that balcony was for the slaves when they gathered. And my question to the people were, and they didn't know this, but I just, I just asked the question. I said, so slaves were welcome in worship. How cool was that? And they began to say, well, we didn't realize that. We just know that 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 part was for the slaves. And I said, I think there was a time when slaves weren't welcome in worship. And so this is a church that began to welcome people who were marginalized and pushed to the edges. And even though they may have been in the balcony at the time, they were still allowed in worship. So what's that mean for us then when there are people who are not, as we look at, not acceptable, that we're a church that accepts people who are unacceptable. That was part of a history. Now, I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to focus on that history of saying, well, we, we were, we were the church that, that were for slavery. So we're not going to go in that direction of black people. That's not the part of history that you, that you look at. That's the part of history that you say, yes, that's who we were, but look at what was happening when we were that way. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, and you're pointing, you're pointing to the fact that sometimes our history tells a story that is not who God is inviting us to be in this time and place. And repentance might be the best thing that we can, we can do, even though we weren't a part of it, to chart a new, a new path and a new way. And part of what's running through my mind is, I've heard this. I'm sure you've heard it, Tim. We've never had a female pastor. Just because that's a part of your history doesn't mean that's a part of your future. Well, you're right. I've heard that before, but they weren't telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, so that's, that's part of what I'm getting at is don't use history as an excuse for bad behavior and poor decision making. Yeah, that would be a place where, uh, again, it's not revision, revisionist history, but it is claiming the history of, oh, we've never had a woman pastor before, but how wonderful it would be for us to be able to receive what God would have for us in and through a woman, another human being, <laughs> a person God has created. There's, there are times in our history that um, we don't use that as an excuse not to do something. Yeah. Um, but there are places in our history where we can say, this is the time to make the decision to do this or that or whatever. I mean, that's. Uh, yeah. So let's shift just a little bit into understanding context because part of history is understanding the stories of people and the why behind quote unquote the way things are done. And and that involves identifying culture and the nuances and the context of what is what is happening around you. So you want to talk a little bit about one way to explore that with folks. So one way to explore our history and to understand our context, we've talked about before on the podcast, and that's the seven missional questions. Really, it's affirming again, and Sarah, you, you know this better than I do, but I'll put it here and then you can make it really wonderful. And that is, that's, that's actually affirming our mission. And then having conversation in the community. I don't know where, uh, it, it's not our history. It, it, it's not in the history of any local congregation 
that people started meeting and just stayed in the room where they were meeting. Every, every church that ever started had a group of people that w- was in the co- community and making connections with people. I've never known of a church that started where everybody said, well, we met in this little room and people just kept showing up in this little room. The story is we met in somebody's living room and each week we invited somebody else to come in and meet with us. They were having conversations in the community. And you've got a couple of questions that you, that you've always used the seven missional questions about when you're talking to people. Those questions are. Yeah. I mean, the first one is where have you witnessed God's presence in your community in the last week? Yeah. Just to, again, you're listening for the stories that people share of where are they encountering God. Um, helping folks to understand what your mission field is. And you can't help people understand what your mission field is until you understand what your mission field is. And so asking the questions around, you know, we have this, we're in this community. What part of this community are we focused on? Are we focused on the school that happens to be right next door to us? Are we focused on the the seniors that are, across the street from us? Are we focused on the the people who are hungry and hurting in our community? And the, the answer might be all of the above, but until you are able to understand what your mission field is and, and to know the community, you're going to have a hard time being able to identify the mission and ministry that is needed in that local context that invites people <laughs> to come to that that living room and say, hey, we're meeting because it's something that they might want to be a part of. Yeah, and and along with that, I've heard you ask the questions of, you know, what do you like about this community? What needs to change? And what needs to change? And then the other question, just because you're in conversation, is are, are you willing to be a part of helping make the change? Yeah. And all that goes along with the other things that you were talking about. When we talk about assets of the community, I mean, I like the idea that there might be a fire station there, or there may be a police station, or there's a library, or there's, uh, those are the kinds of big things that you can see in terms of assets. And then you're identifying the needs in the community. I, I know that most of the people who are listening to us will say, well, we don't have any homeless people in our community. We don't have any people who are hungry in our community. I don't know of any community where there are people so well off that, they, that they're not trying to provide for their families and are surviving. I mean, there's somebody in every community. And what does it say about the church when there are people like that and we're not addressing those those kinds of needs. And I think sometimes we don't even know that. I can give you an example. One of the first uh, communities I was a pastor in, the, the church said, well, we don't have any people who are hungry here. And then one Sunday, a little girl walked into the church. She was barefooted and, and her clothes were dirty. And they asked her who she was and she tried to tell them. And, and then they they asked her where she lived, and she told them. And then without asking her what she needed, she just said, do you have something to eat? We were asking the question, are there any hungry people here? And, well, we just don't know of any hungry people here. And so God sent us a little girl. Now, we could live with our history and say, uh, I mean, just part of that is just, Part of our history is, well, we just haven't seen any little girls or little people who are hungry, so there aren't hungry people. But yet, you have to get out in the community to recognize the need, and you have to get out in the community to recognize the assets. That's part of what what we're talking about with history and context. Yeah. And so we will link on the show notes page to the seven missional questions, and also point you to the other episodes that we've done that will walk through those questions. 
they were early ones. So just know we are almost at episode 200 and a lot of things have changed. It's been, it's been a while. We might even need to, to revisit those. Any other thoughts that you want to share with folks in this introductory episode? I think this month will be a, a fun month of looking at leadership, especially around history and context. So I'm, I'm hoping people will, this, I'm not begging, I'm just hoping people will listen to the podcast because, Sarah, I know that the work that we do on this is, is important to us and that what we know about courageous leadership, it's important to people who are effective in their leadership. So it's grateful to be a part of this and almost 200 episodes. We certainly have learned something. So that's our history. That's our history. A few, a few years long. So here are your write it down, talk it out questions for this week. What are you doing to understand the history that led to your current reality? And what do you understand about your current context? And there you can download the seven missional questions. As a reminder, you can find those links on the Transforming Mission podcast page at transformingmission.org forward slash podcast, or go directly to this episode at transformingmission.org forward slash 198. And remember, who you are is how you lead. Bye for now.